If you have your Bible, turn with me, if you would, to Isaiah 44, verse 8. I want to speak to you this morning on the subject of profound peace. Profound peace. I am so thankful that there is peace that is to be found in the Lord Jesus Christ. Can you say amen? And we welcome you here today. It's especially good to see our students home from Liberty University. Always a joy to see each and every one of you here, and the Lord richly bless you today. And those of you that are joining us via the internet, we welcome you as well, and shout out to you today. Thanks so much for joining us, and we're praying that God's going to touch you and make it possible for you soon to be found in His house again. But notice the words of Isaiah here in chapter 44, verse 8, do not fear, nor be afraid. Have I not told you from that time and declared it? You are my witnesses. Is there a God besides me? Indeed, there is no other rock. I know not one. How about you? Is there any other God like Jehovah? I know not one. Is there any other rock like the rock of our salvation, Jesus Christ? I know not one. Is there any other God who heals like our God? I know not one. Is there any other God that can deliver from all kinds of addictions or what have you? I know not one. Is there any God that can save the sinner from the dregs of sin, establish you on the solid rock of his salvation, and you know that you know that you know that Jesus Christ is King of kings and Lord of lords? I know of none other. No, not one. How many of you find it difficult to cope with everyday stress? I'm the only one here. Some of you are honest. We're going to give an all recall in just a moment for the rest of you. <laughs> Do you find it difficult to have peace of mind and tranquility? The American Psychological Association gave this report in February of the year of 2015. It said that 42% of adults say that they are not doing enough to manage their stress. They find themselves miserable, unhappy, and are not experiencing true peace of mind. Sadly, millions of people around the world are turning to prescription drugs or illegal drugs to help calm their mental anxieties. I never thought in my lifetime that I would ever see where we are legalizing the use of marijuana. I can remember when I was a teenager growing up or what have you, they used to have commercials on TV and they would show eggs being broken and put into a skillet and it would fry and they said, this is your mind on drugs. You remember that? Or am I dating myself? Some of you are brave enough to raise your hands. The rest of you, again, we're having an all recall in just a few moments. Those of you that are younger will excuse you from that. But sadly, sadly, we see a nation that is looking for some kind of an antidote, some kind of a, of a mechanism to be able to cope with all the stress, with all the demands, with all the pressures of daily life. Others turn to music. Some turn to exercise or surf the internet. But my question to you today is, what about you? How are you, as a child of God, coping with the stress of everyday life? Can you truly indeed look to the future with hope? As a Christian, it is important to remember the promises of God and apply them to our lives every day in the different situations that we find ourselves confronted with. Malachi chapter 3 verse 6 tells us about God, For I am the Lord and I do not change. For I am the Lord and I do not change is what God says about himself. And may I invite you, if you've not already underlined that in your Bible, do so and refer to it from time to time. I have found that when I stand on the promises of God's word, it is what sustains me. It is what uplifts me. It is what encourages me. It is what reminds me that the circumstance that I'm faced with is not greater or bigger than the God that I serve. What God is saying here is that he is reliable and he's steady. He's always there and he can be counted on. Again, the writer of Hebrews tells us in Hebrew 13, 8, speaking of God, he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Do you believe that this morning? God has many ways of making himself known, giving us peace of mind and setting our hearts at ease. Now, what is it that makes this possible? Well, I believe that God's presence makes peace of mind possible. How about you? God's presence makes peace of mind possible, and not just for a select few, but for all. 
To be in a real life relationship with God is a staggering and beautiful daily reality that, that God has made available to each and every one of us. Too often as individuals, we wait until times get really tough before we find ourselves finally turning to God. When life is rosy, we don't feel like we need God, but that changes when things get messy, doesn't it? Often we find ourselves overwhelmed with circumstances that we have no control over. Who knows what the future holds other than God himself? Now listen, friends, it's true. Life can be a battle. And our peace of mind at times can be greatly shaken. It's at those moments that we find ourselves reaching and calling out to God. But that's all right, because God, the constant, is there and actually wants to be involved in our lives. Do you understand that this morning? God wants to be involved in your life. Even in the most difficult of times, that's when we can lean upon the Lord, because when I'm weak, he's strong. And praise God, that strength is then given to me and that I can indeed see that I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. But it's only through the strength of God that I'm able to cope, that I'm able to forbear, that I'm able to get through those situations. I can do all things through Christ. That's the key. Through Christ who strengthens me. Jesus tells us, my peace I give you, not as the world gives do I give you. In John 16, let not your heart be troubled. In the world you will have tribulation. But what? Be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. And because Jesus Christ has overcome the world, so can we. Oh, come on. So can we. Because Jesus Christ has overcome the world, so can we. We will all experience stress in our modern fast-paced information overload world. And it's important to do an inventory on our present mental state. We can choose to maintain a positive and a tranquil mind. And our lives, my friend, are not determined by what happens to us, but rather how we react to what happens. It's not what life brings us, but by the attitude that you and I bring to life. Be honest about your mood and emotions, but choose to manage them to promote a positive outcome no matter what. Rather than running around and wringing your hands and saying, oh my, I just don't know what I'm going to do or whatever. Friends, may the very first thing that you and I do is turn to the Lord and say, God, you are my refuge. God, you are my strength. God, you are my deliverer. God, you are my fortress. God, you are the one and only one that can change this situation around. And I choose to place my trust in you. And no matter what my eyes may be telling me, no matter what my ears may be telling me, no matter what my other senses may be telling me, it is in you and you alone that I place my trust. God in his faithfulness will be there. You see, a positive attitude causes a chain reaction of positive thoughts, of positive events, and most importantly, positive outcomes. It is a catalyst or a spark that creates extraordinary results. The Apostle James reinforces this principle by giving us great advice when we face stress, trials, and problems. Here in James chapter 1, verse 2, he tells us, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. Now, I have to be honest with you. First time I read that, it was like, what? I must have misread that. Let me, let me go back. And, what? Count it all joy when you fall into various trials. How many of you are joyful when you're going through a trial? Only various ones, Bill said. Yeah. <laughs> but here's the fact of the matter. We consider it a joy, and listen to what I'm about to say. I consider it a joy that God, in looking at me, sees that Jeff, and you put your name where I'm putting mine right now, okay? So say your name out loud. Jeff, come on, you didn't say it. Say your name out loud, ready? Jeff, I see hidden potential in you that you're not living up to. So therefore, I'm going to put you through a trial, but my grace will be sufficient to see you through it. And because of that, I'm going to make you better than you were before you went through this various trial. And as a result of that, as you put your faith in me and you surrender yourself and remain in a teachable spirit, you on the other side of that trial are going to come out far better and you're going to begin to realize the potential that is there and desire to become all that I have created you to be. Therefore, we can joy when we fall into various trials. 
Now, again, I'm going to date myself. I remember many of you remember the TV series that was on TV back, I think, in the late 70s, early 80s, $6 million man. Remember that? Okay. All right. For those of you who don't, let me just give you a brief history update, okay? This man was a, was a test pilot, and he was in a terrible plane crash, and he survived, but he was all torn apart. So what they decided that they were going to do is they were going to put all these bionics in him and make him better than he was. And one of the things that they showed, you know, they, in the beginning part of the show every week, whatever, is that they said, we're going to make him stronger, we're going to make him wiser, we're going to make him faster, we're going to make him better than he was before. Well, friends, I want you to know something. That's exactly what God is doing with us. And praise God, we're not $6 million men or $6 million people, but rather we indeed are people that indeed have been purchased by nothing less than the blood of Jesus Christ, which makes us... You put the figure in there. Puts us in there to where there's no dollar amount that can be put on it because God considered you to be that valuable. God's saying, you surrender your life to me. I'll make you better, Greg Hansbro. You put your trust in me and I indeed, Shirley Parsons, am going to make you a lady that you never dreamed possible, but I know what I put in you when I created you. And as a result of you surrendering your life over completely to me, I'm going to bring out that potential to its fullest to where people are going to see the love of God resonating in your life, that they're going to want to be like me as a result of God working in our lives. Friends, I want you to understand something. God's not done with you yet. And when you're going through a trial, count it all joy because God wants you to be all that you can be. Now listen, let's be realistic. The trial may be painful, but we are to proceed through the process with a teachable spirit. Why? Well, the answer is found in the following verses here in James 1, verses 3 and 4. Because he tells us that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Wow. That you may be complete, lacking nothing. Every generation has to face hard times and learn how to cope with the trials of life. We can stand firm on the promises of God's word and find examples to pattern our lives after. And when we do, we discover that many of the people that we admire in the Bible had their times of crisis too. But what makes them heroes of the faith was the fact that they had a teachable spirit. That's what made them Hebrew, or excuse me, heroes of the faith. That's what made it possible for them to cross through the trial in victory is the fact that they were teachable. And you know what I like about it is they weren't always teachable at first. Some of them were knuckleheads like me. You know what I'm talking about? I know that doesn't apply to you. That's why I'm preaching to Jeff in this part of the sermon, okay? So you can go ahead and amen. I'm preaching to Jeff right now, not to you. But I'm glad that through it, they developed a teachable spirit. And as a result of that, after they came through that trial, they were far better than they were before they had encountered that trial. You see, we can have a positive attitude, knowing that our character and patience is being strengthened. It also is helpful to smile and even have a sense of humor, even if it is a dry sense of humor. Amen? How many of you know that smile and laughter, indeed, is medicine to the soul? It'll get you through difficult times when, when you can look at it and, and laugh. <laughs> Satan, you thought you had me tripped up. You thought you had me down and out for the count. Well, I'm here to tell you right now, you were fooled. You may have knocked me down, but you didn't knock me out. Amen? That's the mentality we need to have. Staying positive. Look, friends, I'm not saying that it's easy, but what I'm saying is faith makes it possible. It makes it possible. It doesn't make it easy, but it makes it possible. Be ready to call out to God in prayer at an instant's notice. Paul tells us in Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 and 7, I know you've heard it many times and probably can quote it, but Paul says, be anxious for nothing. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Boy, I don't know about you, but I'm about ready to have a hallelujah shouting time up here. These, these verses of Scripture have a way, just reading them out loud, 
Doesn't it have a way of, of encouraging you and reminding you of the fact of God's faithfulness? Friend, we need to read the word of God. We need to spend time in prayer. We need to know the promises that are there. And even though at that particular time it may have been made to a specific individual, bear in mind, God's not a respecter of persons. The promises that he made to Abraham, the promises that he made to Sarah, the promises that he made to David, the promises that he made to Ruth, the promises that he made to Esther, the promises that he made to John and Peter and Andrew and all the other people that are listed there, they have your name on them too. Claim them. In the name of Jesus, begin to walk in victory that God alone has promised. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Amen. Perhaps your life is going well, but you sense something is out of sync. Often the lack of peace in our lives results from the absence of God in our lives. However, when we include God in our lives, we begin to see things from his vantage point. God knows what the future holds for each of us. And he has promised us in 2 Corinthians, <clears throat> excuse me, chapter 12, verse 9, his grace is sufficient for us, for his strength is made perfect in weakness. Now look, that doesn't mean that we're not going to go through difficult times as a child of God. How many of you would agree with that? We are. We are. Reality tells us that we will have problems in this life. But there is a peace and a strength that God's presence provides. Hallelujah. Paul sums it up in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 8 and 9, when he says, We are hard-pressed on every side, but not crushed perplexed, but not in despair, persecuted, but not abandoned, struck down, but praise God, not, come on, say it with me, not destroyed. Man, I love that. Okay, I'm pressed hard on every side. I've got a lot of stuff going on in my life. How about you? I mean, I'm saying that as a fact. I have a lot of stuff going on in my life right now. And I told my wife, I said, I don't know when I've ever seen so much sickness. And not just plain sickness, but serious sickness is what's running rampant. And talking with other pastors, it's the same way. My good friend, Pastor Carter Dean over in Shenandoah told me since January of this year, he has already done 15 funerals. Can you imagine? I mean, I said, Carter, my lands. He said, oh, they haven't all been in our church. He said, but they've been close friends, family whatever. And I said, I am going to pray for you even harder than what I have been before, because trust me, it, it takes an effect. In case you didn't know it, pastors are human too. And it does take an effect. But I want to remind you that even though we're pressed on every side, we're not crushed. We're not perplexed. We're not in despair. We're persecuted, but not abandoned. We may be struck down, but we're not destroyed because I look to the hill from whence cometh my help. I look to the rock of my salvation. I boldly proclaim, God, you are greater. You are greater. You are my God, and you've never failed me. See, when we go through the problems, and we go through them in our relationship with God, we can react to them with a different perspective and with a strength that is not our own. And I'm thankful I don't have to rely upon my own strength. How about you? No problem has the capacity to be insurmountable to God. We find ourselves that we're not left to deal with them alone. You know, I'm, I'm thankful that, that God's presence in our lives assures us that we can truly have peace of mind, but I'm also thankful that God's power reveals his love for us, aren't you? God's power reveals his love for us. God's power is always accompanied by not just a love, but an unconditional deep love that ministers to every need that I ever needed to know that somebody loved me, someone genuinely cared for me, somebody accepted me despite all of my shortcomings, all my faults, all my misgivings, all the times that I failed miserably or whatever. God says it doesn't matter. I love you anyway. Hallelujah. The Bible tells us in Nahum, Chapter 1, verse 7, the Lord is good. In fact, we sang about that earlier, didn't we? 
The Lord is good. What is he? A refuge. A refuge in times of trouble. He cares for those who trust in him. Listen, friend, we have no idea what the future holds. If it brings hard times, God will be there for us. If it brings easy times, we will still need God to fill that inner void we have and to give our lives a true sense of meaning. When all is said and done, what really matters most, I believe that it is knowing that we are not separated from him or from his presence. When you know him as your savior and you know him as your Lord, you can indeed have a true peace in the midst of all circumstances. Why must he be the central of our lives? Because there is no real peace or hope apart from knowing him, the Prince of Peace. He's God. We're not. And I don't know about you, but that's, that's hard for me to accept at times. Not that I think I'm God, don't get me wrong, but I try to be God because I'm a fixer. And when I come up against a situation that I can't fix, it's very frustrating. I'm just admitting that to you. It is. And it's like, you know, I, I find myself, if I'm not careful, and again, I'm just bearing my heart to you, you know, I find myself at times saying, God, it's not fair. I want to fix this. God is saying, my grace is sufficient for you. Do you believe me in me, Jeff? Do you believe that I want what's best for you? Do you believe that I want what's best for this other person that you're praying for and, and, and you are not seeing the, the, the things that you're hoping for and the things that you're, there's a reason. Will you trust me? I'm not going to give you the answer now, but will you trust me, Jeff? Will you indeed place your complete confidence in me that I had a plan for this individual before they even drew their first breath of life, before they were even a twinkle in their daddy's eye, I had ordained their steps and that I had a plan for their life and this is all part of the plan. Now, will you trust me and know that it will lead to a good end? See, that's, that's the bottom line. Rather than having a pity party and rather than sitting around frustrated or whatever, you're God, I'm not. You're a loving father that unconditionally loves me, that has a plan for my life, that is desiring what is best for me. So therefore, God, I will do my best to submit my will to yours and in the times that I don't, please, God, forgive me and help me to repent and get back on track. I don't know how to put it any other way. That's what gets us through. That's what sustains us. That's what gives us the confidence of knowing he's God and we're not. Listen, he depends, or excuse me, we depend on him. He does not depend on us. We depend on him. He does not depend on us. He created us to need his presence in our lives. Oh, we can try to make life work without him, but it will be so hollow, so empty, so unfulfilling. God wants to be involved in our lives every moment of every day. And our greatest problems are spiritual when it comes to peace. God knows this. So he provided a solution for our separation from him through his son, Jesus Christ. Hebrews 13.5 tells us that God has promised to what? Never leave us or to forsake us. Do you believe that? I mean, do you really believe that? Is that more than just head knowledge? Is that heart knowledge? God, you will never leave me. You will never forsake me. God, even in the most difficult of times, even in the times, God, where I feel like I've had the breath knocked out of me and I'm laying there on the ground and I'm, I'm gasping for air and, and God, it just seems like, wow, this is it. This is the final curtain call. God, you've promised that you'll never leave me, you'll never forsake me, even in times of when we might indeed be, be facing death. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art, for thou art. See, that's what picks us up, isn't it? Knowing that God is there. Knowing that God is able to fix what we can't. And knowing that God has a perfect plan that when we are with him in eternity, suddenly we're going to have a full understanding as to why certain things take place in life. Psalm 68 verse 5 also promises that he will be a father to the fatherless. And I don't know about you, but that's very comforting to know that he is a father to the fatherless. I'm smart enough to know that, that I'm very blessed to have had the parents that I have 
because there's a lot of people who, who don't have or did not have great relationships with their earthly father or their earthly mother. But aren't you glad that God has promised that he is a father to the fatherless? No matter what happens in the world around us, my friend, we can have peace of mind knowing that God will be there for us. In this world of turmoil and stress, we all need God's peace of mind. As the praise team makes their way forward, let me close with this. In the fourth chapter of Mark's gospel, verses 35 through 41, we read the account of Jesus and his disciples being caught in a raging storm out in the middle of the Sea of Galilee. The disciples were scared and panicking and were desperately trying to keep their boat from sinking. Where was Jesus? In the back of the boat, sound asleep with his head on a pillow. Didn't he realize waves were crashing in over the sides of the boat? Didn't he realize they were taking on water? Didn't he realize that in just a matter of moments, if he didn't, you know, something didn't change or whatever, we're going to perish, we're going to sink. That was the mentality that the disciples had. Now listen very carefully. I'm sure that many of you, if not all of you, have read that story many times, and so have I. But I confess I never really paid enough attention to what Jesus told his disciples there in verse 36. This is what Jesus said. After Jesus had left the, the crowds of people, he got into the boat and he told his disciples, listen to these words, let us cross over to the other side. Now, is there anything there that jumps off the page to you? Let us cross over to the other side. It's a two-letter word, us. The disciples were worrying about perishing in the midst of the raging storm. Jesus, however, was sound asleep in the back of the boat because he had already given them his personal guarantee, we're going to make it to the other side. Jesus didn't just say, help me across to the other side. He said, let us cross over to the other side. Friends, if Jesus said, let us cross over to the other side, you can rest assured that no matter what you are going through, you are going to make it safely to the other side because Jesus said, let us cross over to the other side. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. <clears throat> no matter the situation, no matter the circumstances, if God is with us, we will make it through safely to the other side of any and every problem that you will ever face in this life. Do not lose hope. Do not lose hope. Because God will indeed give you a profound peace like no other. Lord, today... There are a lot of situations and circumstances that are taking place in our church family. And I confess, God, I don't understand a lot of things that are happening. But I do know this, there is power in prayer. And God, I don't just say it for something to say when I stand before my, my friends and family here at HFA and encourage them to pray. I believe there is power. There is power. In the name of Jesus, when we pray, stand in the gap, make up the hedge on behalf of so many of our beloved friends and neighbors. And so today, Lord, I, I ask that you would help us to continue to grow in our walk with you. That, Lord, our, our prayer life will grow stronger daily as we pull out, Lord, the insert in our bulletin and we pray over the names that are there. We may not know these people personally. We may not know the nature of their need, but you do. And Lord, as we mention their name before you, I believe that that releases the power of Almighty God into that situation, into their lives. God, that you will work on their behalf. May not always be the way that we think that you should, but nevertheless, thankful God that you give a peace. You stand in the midst of the raging storm and Lord, there in Mark chapter four, it said that you stood, simply said, peace be still. The waves abated, the wind died down. And where there had just seconds before been a raging storm that the disciples were convinced were gonna take their lives, 
There was now a tranquility, peacefulness, because Jesus was there on the scene. So Lord, in just a few moments, as we open the altars for those who would like to have prayer today, I pray, God, that you will indeed begin to minister to lives. Father God, that there will indeed be healings that take place. There will be encouragement that takes place. Lord, there will be a calming of whatever storm is raging in the lives of individuals here today. They're going to sense that Jesus, the master of the storm, is here on the scene. I'm going to ask this morning if our board members would make their way to the front. There's some anointing oil here on the table. Would you do that, please? Just go ahead. If you're a board member, make your way to the front at this time. If you have a vial of oil with you, I'd encourage you to bring it. I invite others of you as well. If you feel led this morning to just come in and pray for individuals, would you make your way to the front? Come on, let me, let me encourage you. It's not just for board members. Now, if you're here with a need, and it doesn't have to be physical. A lot of times we think that, you know, when we have anointing services that it's just for a physical need. But if you do have a physical need, by all means, I invite you to make your way forward. But if you're going through a trial, if you're going through a certain situation that you just need an assurance of God's presence in your life, I invite you to make your way to the front. Come on, right now. Just get up. I, I just feel the impression of the Lord. You know who you are. Don't worry about what anybody else thinks. This is one-on-one -on -one time with God. Board members, go ahead and spread yourselves out a little bit so if there's more than, you know, several people making their way forward. Maybe there's a financial need. Maybe there's a relationship that needs to be healed, needs to be mended. Maybe your heart's not right with God. I mean, look, I'm not standing in judgment. I'm just throwing needs out there. Maybe you just need to be encouraged. Maybe you're going through a time that has just really overwhelmed you and you are discouraged and you are reeling and you just don't know, wow, God, this, this completely caught me off guard. This knocked the wind out of my sails. God, I'm just standing here just, just wondering God, how are, how are you going to bring something good out of this? Jesus said, let us cross over to the other side. I can't emphasize that to you enough. When Jesus says, let us cross over to the other side, as I said earlier, you're going to make it to the other side. And you're going to be better as a result of it. So don't let the situation rob you of the joy of the trial. Don't allow it to rob you of your strength. Don't allow it to rob you of an opportunity to walk in complete victory that God has for all of us. I'm going to ask you, if you would, would you stretch a hand toward the individuals that are up here? And if you feel led again to come and pray for somebody, let me invite you to just make your way. Come on. Let's believe and trust God on behalf of these individuals. These are family. These are friends. If you have oil, can you pass it? We have some people that still need to be anointed. If you have a vial of oil, bottle of oil, would you just pass it off to someone? Now lift your voice. Come on. You know how to pray. I'm not going to tell you what to say, but you just begin praying. You don't have to pray out real loud, but just softly. Say it verbally so you can hear it, okay? Say it verbally so you can hear it. Say it audibly so you can hear it. Because there's something about hearing your own prayer that helps you to have your faith build up. So you lift your voice along with mine. Come on, church, let's pray. Lord, today, I ask on behalf of every individual that is standing here before us, that Lord, in your faithfulness, in your mercy, in your love, that you will begin to undertake on their behalf. Thank you for the work that has already begun. And Lord, we're believing that as the work has begun, that in your faithfulness, you're going to see it through to its completion. We profess that with our God, nothing is too difficult. Nothing is impossible. And God, you can do what no other power can do. We pray that the power of Almighty God might descend even now into this place. 
that Lord, you'll begin to touch hearts, you'll begin to touch lives, and Lord, that one that was discouraged, that Lord, those arms that were hanging down in defeat will be raised up in victory. That head that was hanging down, Lord, will be lifted up because you are the glory and the lifter of our heads. God, we look to the hill from where comes our strength, knowing that our God is ever faithful in performing the promises of his word. I'm thankful that there is no God like Jehovah God. Lord, you have promised us in your word that you are the God that heals us of every sickness, of every illness, of every affliction. Lord, I would pray today on behalf of the many of our congregation who stand in need of a healing touch from you. Oh God, may your hand of health and restoring power touch them this very moment. Might they sense a quickening in their being, in their body, in their mind knowing that Jesus, the great physician, is there on the scene. I pray for that one, Lord, that perhaps is having problems with relationships, whether it be their marriage. Maybe it's with a, a sibling, Lord. Maybe it's, it's a parent-child relationship. Might be friends. Might be in-laws. God, I, I don't know, but you do. I pray for a healing. I pray for a reconciliation even now. I pray, Lord, for that one who's bound by some kind of an addiction to a vice whether it be alcohol, whether it be nicotine, Lord, whether it be pornography, whether, Lord, it be a drug of some form or other. Right now, I pray in the mighty name of Jesus that those chains would be broken. Oh God, may they fall at the foot of the cross and may they walk in the freedom that you alone provide as almighty God. Lord, we're believing in this year of 2019 that it is a year of renewal. It is a year of renewal as we renew our commitment to you, as we renew Oh God, ourselves to evangelism as we renew ourselves in our commitment to discipleship and renew our commitment to prayer. We are believing that we are going to see the manifested presence of God like never before in our lives daily. God, you know every need that is here. And I pray today in the privacy of this moment you would speak into the hearts and the lives of individuals. May no one walk out of here untouched, unchanged, without the assurance of knowing that their sins are forgiven and that they're a child of God. As we continue to pray, I want to make one more appeal before we close the service out, and that's this. Friend, if you would happen to be here, and by chance, you don't know that it's well with your soul. God's been speaking to you, and you realize your need of Him as your Savior, as your Lord. You recognize that you're separated, and if Christ were to come back in the next few moments, you honestly cannot say, I know that heaven would be my eternal home. You can. Jesus took your place on the cross, paid the price for your sins, just like he did mine, just like he did everybody else. Today, he wants to be your Lord and your Savior. And if you want that true peace of mind, if you want that true assurance, I encourage you to ask him into your life today. If that's you, just simply raise your hand and put it back down. You don't have to leave it up for a long time and say, Pastor, pray for me. I know I need Jesus. Yes, I see those hands. Are there others? You need the Lord? Yes, yes. Are there others? You need Jesus? Yes. Are there others? God's speaking today, pausing just a moment longer. You need the Lord. You know your heart's not right. You want that peace, that profound peace, that true peace that only God can give. Anyone else? Yes, let me put it down. Is there another? Would you pray together with me collectively as a congregation? Dear Jesus, I come today just as I am. And I do surrender all. I place my life in your hands, asking for your forgiveness. Jesus, I confess that you are the only begotten Son of God who takes away the sins of of a sinner like me. So today, Lord, wash them away with your precious blood. Come into my life. Be my Lord. Be my Savior. Write my name in the Lamb's Book of Life that I can know that I know that I am a child of God, my sins are forgiven, and that I have the blessed promise of knowing I will spend and eternity with you. Thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. I ask these things in Jesus' precious name. 
Amen. Can we give a clap offering to the Lord today? Aren't you glad for the profound peace that Jesus Christ alone provides?